this is Gilbert Gottfried, and this is Gilbert Gottfried's amazing, colossal podcast with my co-host, Frank Santo Padre. Our guest this week is an accomplished actor and stage and screen, an Emmy-nominated and DGA award-winning director of feature films, TV movies, hundreds of hours of network television. As an actor, you've seen him in movies like Fuzz, Funny Man, Medium Cool, Whatever Happened to Aunt Alice, Catch-22, Serial, and Man on the Moon. And in the popular TV series, The Addams Family, Sanford and Son, 9 to 5, Murder, She Wrote, Home Improvement, and Parks and Recreation. But he's perhaps best known to audiences for playing the sarcastic dentist, Jerry Robinson, Barb Hartley's friend and office mate on one of the most beloved situation comedies of all time, The Bob Newhart Show. In a performing career spanning seven decades, he shared the big and small screen with Peter Ustinov, Orson Welles, Christopher Lee, Burt Reynolds, Jim Carrey, and Robert De Niro, as well as former podcast guests Michael McKeon, Jessica Walter, Hal Linden, Chuck McCann, and Carl Reiner. As a director, he's helmed popular and critically acclaimed television shows such as The Mary Tyler Moore Show, Friends, News Radio, Wings, Just Shoot Me, and Murphy Brown, and worked with dozens of our favorite stars, including William Shatner, George Siegel, Betty White, Tony Randall, and Jack Klugman. And even a brilliant performer known as Gilbert Gottfried. Please welcome to the show a man of multiple talents and the, what, the only guest we know of who played another one of our guests. Peter Bonners. Hello. Peter, how are you? I'm just fine. We're so glad you slept, and well, even though it was slept, only 10 minutes. I, it's, it was 10 minutes from my doorstep, so uh, it wasn't m- much of a drive. Do you remember directing this man? Yes, I do. Uh, uh, what was the show? So uh, I, I think it was two shows. Oh. Uh, there was Wings. Oh, yes. You know, on the drive over... I, I was preparing <laughs> by saying, Gilbert Gottfried, yes, what show was that? And I, Wings was the first one that popped into my my, my head. But, you know, I, I have an 80-year-old head, so I can't trust it anymore. Wings and the other one? Uh, uh, Hope and Gloria. Ah, oh, Hope and Gloria. That was a With, short-lived show. Oh, yes. And I remember it was... Alan Thicke, Cynthia Stevenson, Great. Jessica Lund, Holy and cow. Erica, uh, oh, Enrico Colantoni. Ooh, Enrico Colantoni. What a wonderful actor. Oh, he was terrific. He probably still is. I, I haven't seen him for a while. Oh, I had so much fun with him. Yeah, he, he, he was great. And then I worked with him again, I think, on Just Shoot Me. Gilbert was in the episode Say Uncle Carlton, with Bic- well, where he was Bill Hickey's nephew or grandson. Oh. Uh, yeah, his grandson. Bill Hickey, yeah. another right. great actor. There's a name. I actually studied acting with Bill Hickey in New York. Wow. At the, uh, oh, no at kidding. The, uh, at HB. HB. Yeah, 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 he yeah, taught yeah, there yeah. forever. Oh, he was a wonderful actor and a terrific, uh, uh, a terrific acting coach. Uh, very good teacher. You have memories a, a of Bill Hickey? A strange fellow. I, yes, very odd guy. <laughs> I, what, well, well he, he was he was severely uh, severely al- alcoholic. Oh, so by the time we got to <laughs> work with him, no, no. By the time we got to work with him, he was really uh, uh, only thirty percent on the set. Yeah, I remember. What was funny it was one of those almost cliche things. 
he would be walking there, and he looked like the living dead. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He, I thought he was going to drop dead any second. <laughs> Yeah. And and yet he was one of those people. You yelled action, and he did it. Right. You know, there, there's a thing that in in the theater, uh, uh, Doctor Theater, uh, a, a a a person can be sick or uh, uh-huh. uh, abusing any number of substances, and when they, when they call action or when the uh, the French stage director goes thunk 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 on the floor or when the curtain opens, they're there. And they're there for, you know, the necessary uh, 30 seconds uh, on camera or three hours on stage, and then they collapse. Yeah. It's a curious thing. It's, it, I guess it's adrenaline, but uh, doctor theater, yeah. Yeah, I think I worked with Shirley Hempel, and I experienced the same thing. <laughs> same thing. thing. Uh, yeah, she yeah. was. Uh, uh, I could name names of people that I worked, worked okay. with. Okay. Now, you. <clears throat> but you, I won't. You gave me a piece of direction once. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> Where you said, okay, let's do another take and act better. <laughs> <Yeah>. Perfect. <laughs> exactly. I can't tell you how, how many real big shots I've given that same simple direction to. Because if a person's a professional, that's all they need. I say, yeah. okay, I can act better than that. If they're not a professional, they get very confused and sometimes angry. But I've, I've given that direction to uh, Bill Shatner, to Candace Bergen, to Bob Newhart, to uh, Suzanne Plachette, to uh, Peter Cook, any number of, of really good pros. A- and it works. You, you could probably give that to athletes, too. Oh, hey, I'm just sure. pick, pick up your game a little bit. Act better. You, I, you might be able to give that direction to Donald Trump, but because he's so poor at what he does, <laughs> he, he, he would merely get angry. Yeah. What do you mean better? I'm the best I can be all the time. Yeah, well, that's it, sociopaths and, for you. And uh, <laughs> a, a day or two after I completed that episode of Wings, I I was doing a voiceover and I ran into one of your old co-stars, Marsha Wallace. Oh, great! And and I said, oh, I uh, I just got directed by uh, someone you know, Peter Bonners, and and she looked at me and said, and what did he tell you to do? Act better. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, that that means that uh, I I had. Uh, undying respect for both you and Marsha's acting ability. Love it. And, well, I, I heard a story like uh, Michael Douglas, uh, Oliver Stone said to him at one point, he said, are you on drugs or anything? And he said, no. He goes, are you okay? And he said, what do you think of the performance you've been giving? And Michael Douglas said, <laughs> I, I thought it was pretty good. And <laughs> Oliver Stone said, yeah, it is pretty good. <laughs> and, and that was what that's, he that's needed to tell better. him, no, no, we want more than pretty good. Exactly yeah. so. So be a little better. Yeah. Well, well now I'm curious, yeah. because the second time, was it the first or second time? Because in Hope and Glory, you were actually playing yourself. So if you got that direction, <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> that's really, that's I, a sad I state of affairs. I suck as myself, yes. <laughs> oh, no. See, I, I, I could argue, and I can argue anything, because I... I'm been schooled by the Jesuits. Jesuits uh, can argue anything, and I could argue that the hardest person to act is yourself. Oh, absolutely. So when I was saying act better, uh, I meant you know try to get a little closer to that person whose name is Gilbert Gottfried, and that's a hard thing, hard thing to do because even when you look in the mirror, you don't see yourself. No, you you, you see. A polar opposite image. You see a mirror image of yourself. Tell tell uh, tell Peter. It's interesting what the uh, direction David Steinberg gave you when he was directing. Oh, you. at I, worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. David Steinberg was directing me where I had to say something and then run off the set, and uh, I did it. And Steinberg said, "Can you run a little faster?" 
And, <laughs> and, and I said, yeah, I could run a little faster. And he said, no, no, I don't want faster necessarily. I want it more graceful. And I said, <laughs> graceful? And he said, yeah, you know, less choppy, more evenly. And then finally, I shrugged my shoulders and he threw his hands up in the air and he goes, can you run less Jewish? <laughs> That's very good. That's and and I knew good. exactly what he meant. <laughs> Peter, tell us tell us about the early days. You mentioned being uh, raised by the or schooled by the Jesuits. You're, you're from yeah. you were you were born in New Hampshire. You grew up in Milwaukee. Oh, you got it all there. It's all yeah. it's all written down. Isn't it's it? all written down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you went into. I, I saw an interview with you with. Uh, I yeah. think it was the Television Academy. Yes. Oh, wow. You were talking about that was a good interview. A yeah, long was... time, boy. I said that that was really fun. I really enjoyed that because. When people ask you questions, you immediately respond and you call these memories up that mm-hmm. you didn't know you had. Mm-hmm. That's what we do every uh, week and, here. And I, I, oh, well, great. Good for you. I really enjoyed that interview, I must say. So uh, you go on with your question. No, I was just going to say, we found it interesting. You were, you were dealing with a stutter. Is that what, part of what attracted you to acting? I think so, yeah. I, as, a, as an only child, uh, I stuttered. And um, I... I really stuttered seriously. I had uh, blocking sort of, sort of stuttering, and they, <laughs> this is not uncommon for stutterers to stutter on the first initials of their uh, names. And I, so I stuttered on the P and the B. Oh, so, interesting. It was terrible. And it really isolated me. I became uh, socially isolated. Uh, then around fourth grade or so, uh, a, a nun. I went to a Catholic school, and I, because I stuttered, I think I was driven to act foolish. I had seen Danny Kaye in the movies, uh-huh. and, and I had seen the <laughs> Marx Brothers, and I knew that acting foolish was a good thing because people liked them. Interesting. People liked people who acted silly. So I acted silly in class, and a nun said, Peter, would you stand up, please? She said, is that what you want to do in life? You just want to be a silly guy? And uh, where most kids would hang hang their heads in embarrassment, I actually thought about that for a second. Interesting. I said, well, what's the choice here? Being a stutterer or a silly guy that commands attention? And that stuck with me for about 15 seconds. And then when I was in high school uh, in speech class, I still stuttered, and a uh, Jesuit said, you know, they say that uh, for people who stutter, when they get on stage, they don't stutter because they know what they're going to say. Oh, fascinating. It was a theory that this guy had. So uh, I entered the elocution contest by performing a piece I got from watching the Sid Caesar television show, Weirdo Shoes. <laughs> and it, was, it, it was a monologue about a guy walking down the street and seeing a pair of uh, silly shoes in the uh-huh. wind, window, and he goes in and try, tries them on and stuff. And it was a pretty funny r- routine, and I memorized it, and I did it, and I, <laughs> the other <laughs> contestants at this Jesuit high school were doing uh, uh, soliloquies from Shakespeare and the Gettysburg Address and prayers and all sorts of stuff, and I got up there and did <laughs> Sid Caesar. <laughs> this Jewish entertainer in a Jesuit school. And heaven knows I won the contest. Wow. And that said to me, okay, this is you can do this in front of people now. Then I started to act in plays in high school. Then when I was in college, I acted in plays, and I got a scholarship. So it, it really started to snowball there. I figured that this was something uh, that I had a talent for. And uh, <clears throat> they would pay me for it. They gave me a scholarship at Marquette University. Yeah. And then I, I, I you know, I did some uh, MC work and stuff. And you did a little stand-up, too? Oh, yeah. Because in those days, that's what you did. I, I had uh, seen the work of uh, Second City and uh, Mike Nichols, Elaine May, Shelley Berman, Bob Newhart, of course. Yeah. And uh, Lenny Bruce was our, our, our idol during those years. 
and I cobbled together an act. I was a jazz drummer, so between uh, 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 sets, I would get up and do a set of comedy, which was about five minutes or so. I never had more than 20 minutes in my life. <laughs> <laughs> you never had many, more than 20 minutes of material? No, no, no. Because yeah. I can't write where the, where the shit. So I went to New York. <laughs> I, I can't write. And, and I've tried. I mean, I've got a, a, a whole warehouse, for, not a warehouse, but a stack of stuff in the garage, screen uh-huh. plays. I cannot write. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> I'm, I'm not stupid, and I'm, I, I know big words and stuff. I can't write. I uh. just have no... St- so when I went went to New York and started my stand-up career, I was at a place called Upstairs at the Duplex. Oh, sure. Here's who was on stage with me. Woody Allen, Dick Cavett, uh... Siegel, George, but, but he sang. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Joan Woody, Rivers? Dick and Joan, yeah. yeah. And and then me, and Peter Bonners from Milwaukee. <laughs> Woody would get up there and do three sets a night with different material. Amazing. And I got up once, once a night, and did the same stupid talking Christmas tree. It was embarrassing. Didn't you have a story? I, I remember a story now. You had a, a date with you, and you asked her to evaluate your performance. My wife. Oh, it was your wife. The woman I'm, the woman I'm going future, home to. Your Roz, future wife. Roz Bonners, my wife that I met in the fourth grade. And she came came to New York, and she saw me up, up against uh, uh, Cabot and Woody Allen. And uh, I, I said, what would you think? And she said, boy, that Dick Cabot was really funny. <laughs> 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 but I tell you, that's we, we're still married. I've known her since I was eight years old. Oh, that's and, romantic. Uh, eight, 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 eight years old. She's, she's honest. Yeah. And she's really bright. She reads a lot of books, sees a lot of movies. We go to a lot of theater, a lot of music. So I trust her. I trust her. Had she said, oh, you were like the other girls that I was dating, you were really funny. She didn't go there. She gave me the honest evaluation. And uh, it's a good thing she did, because I, at that point, said, maybe I should stop flogging myself here. Those guys are funny. It's not funny because they're Jewish. Dick Cavett wasn't even Jewish. Sure. You're not going to do this. You do that other thing. You do improvisational theater. You can act a little bit. So I went there. And do you remember any of the material? Talking you Christmas tree. Yeah. Can you do? Can you? Can you? No. Uh, tree next. Uh, uh, no. Peter warned us. No, no. But I tell you what I would. Uh, what I used yes. to do when I ran out of material, when they wanted me to do the second set. Yes. I would do a what they call what I called a professor spot that I stole from Second City Severin Darden. Oh, the great, great Severin Darden, improvisational actor. And he would get on on stage and in a German accent. I could do, do a little German accent, and I would ask the audience for an area of expertise. Physics, astronomy, um, you you name it. Uh, biographies of famous people, and then I would extemporize a lecture. And I, you know, I had a pretty good education, uh, so I could bluff my way through four or five minutes of questions from the audience with a German accent, and that's always funny to begin with because people always laugh at act. So that was where. Uh, that's the only thing that I remember that I actually actually got consistent laughs at or with because uh, they thought I was making it up, and I was because I was desperate. <laughs> <laughs> How did you make the transition into into improv? Because eventually you joined the well, pre- the premise uh, and yeah yeah. One of the reasons that I went to New York from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, with one suitcase and two hundred dollars. Uh, was that I had seen Second City in 1959. And it, it, it literally turned my life around uh, the way I, I've heard musicians talk about hearing Charlie Parker mm-hmm. or Art Tatum. They, they just go, what? People are doing that live on the stage night after night? I couldn't believe it. Mm-hmm. These people were talented. They were funny. They were touching. This was Paul Sand, Alan Arkin, Bar- Barbara Harris, Severn Darden. Wow. The list goes on. You know the list. Yeah, Paul, uh, Paul Sills, of course. I, yeah. yeah. It turned my life around. And Paul Sills became 
uh, my my guru. I would uh, I, I've worked with him in Story Theater, and I went to his workshops up in Green Bay, Wisconsin. He, he was a fabulous person. A lot of people. I met a woman in the lobby here at the recording studio, and she, and she, and she was a member of an improv group. Uh, the the improv people today, first of all, we used to call it improvisational theater. Uh-huh. It had a much much classier ring to it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but th- they don't even know who Paul Sills was. Yeah, it's a shame. Or or, or his mother, Viola Small, and who wrote the book Improvisation for the Theater. Yeah, it's a shame. It all all came from her book. It wasn't Del Close. It, it was Viola Small and her son Paul Paul Sills. Didn't I you? hope this gets in the podcast. People oh, should know this. Absolutely. Yes. Didn't you? Didn't you try to join? And you said that Paul threw you out the door. Yeah, I went down there. Uh, <laughs> physically threw you in the street. <laughs> I would go down on weekends to see the show, and uh, one weekend I finally got up the courage and I went to Paul and I, I said, "Look, I'm graduating from college here next semester, and I would like to just uh, throw myself at your feet. I, I, I don't expect to be paid or anything." And he said. He looked at me and he said, "I'm busy." <laughs> he took, took me. <laughs> he took me around. No, I, I swear this is true. He turned turned me around, looked me in the eye, and said, "I'm very busy here. I'm directing this show. How old are you?" And I said, "I'm I'm 19." He said, "Okay, here's what what you do. Go back to where." Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Go back to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, finish theater, and figure it out for yourself. Oh, wow. <laughs> and he pushed me out the door. It was, it was fabulous. I could have sucked around that for a long time, you know, just waiting by the door. And I went back to Milwaukee, and we started a little improv group of our own. Right. And did some stand-up. And I, I literally... Figured it out. Yeah, but that that involved coming to New York and 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 joining joining the premise. In other words, he said, "Get out of here, act better." I got you. (laughs) (laughs) Now, now, when did you get your first actual job in show? Nineteen sixty one at the Premise Theater, Uh, not at the Premise Theater uh, on McDougal and um, Bleecker. Yeah. Uh, it was in the old ba- the old basement. In the old basement, yeah. Ted Flicker. Oh, what a wonderful Ted, show Ted that was. Ted Flicker. Uh, and um, Gilbert and I were they, just talking they, about they the President's Analyst. They wanted to do a summer show. Oh, what a swell movie. Yeah, right? Ted Flicker. Yep. Uh, Joan Darling, Tommy Aldrich. Yeah. Oh, boy. Buck is still living. In, we had, had Buck, Buck on the show. show? We had oh, him a couple. We had him a couple of months ago. He's he's one of those one of the funniest people that I've ever met in my life. He is great. Peter Cook, Buck Henry. Oh my God! I I could he, 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 uh, I could even quote him. <laughs> anyway, here I'll give you a Buck Henry quote. Uh, we're in. Uh, it used to be called uh, Peking. We were in, in Beijing, China. The second trip over after uh, uh, Jane Fonda. And uh, Buck and I uh, were there, and we saw this interminable opera, one of these uh, Red Women's Brigade opera that go on for five hours. And it's it's just about the heroes of of the the social magical world. And uh, we're sitting with 35 uh, American tourists, and we're bored stiff. And I asked Buck, what's the name of this? And he's, and without hesitation, he said, they're doing Moon Over My Army. <laughs> it, it was the Red Brigade of Women. It's, it's beautiful, these beautiful. And so I nudged the person next to me and said, Moon Over My Army. And then she nudged the person next to her. So for the next 35 seconds, Hilarious. you heard these Americans going, oh, 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 35 different laughs. <laughs> He's a genius. <laughs> moon, moon over my army. Yeah. Anyway, uh, they were doing a show in Westport, Connecticut, and a guy named Zev Putterman, a wonderful director, uh, hired me to go up with Sandy Barron. You remember Sandy Barron? Oh, Sandy Barron. Oh, yes. Sure. We, talk, Sandy we talked about him on this show. And I and a couple other Is people. James Frawley in that group? Him. No. Oh. No, James Frawley w- was actually in the New York group. Oh, he's in the New York the group. Okay, Westport group with, uh, with Sandy. Uh, okay, but that Sandy. was my first first job. Got paid sixty five dollars a week in nineteen sixty one, and I was on my way. This was it, the start of Peter Bonner's in the show business. 
got back to New York waiting to be plugged into the New York show, what do I get in the mail? Greetings. I was drafted into His Majesty's United States oh, Army wow. and spent two years of my life in the Army at that very moment when my career could have take, taken off. Such is my hatred for the military. <laughs> Thank heaven it was only two years. <clears throat> yeah, and, and it was a pretty good two, two years because I was stationed in Long Island City at what is now the Astoria Studios. Right, and I, I, I worked making training films uh, with the United States Army. Oh, oh great! That that sounds like a cushy. Uh, and I lived in you did the and Frank I lived Capra in thing. Manhattan. I lived in Manhattan. Exactly. He he was there. I lived in Manhattan. Took the subway to the army. Well, that, that worked and, out. And lived you, in Hell's Kitchen, twenty dollars a month. And you said you uh, all of your friends would like try to outsmart the draft board. Yes. Who told you that? Ah, uh, in one of your interviews. Okay, well, yeah. I just keep repeating it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. we, we do research here, Peter. Interview number 12. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, most of my show business friends at that, that time were really clever and knew how to get out of the draft. They could say they were gay. They could say they were drug addicts. They could uh, drink a lot of coffee uh, the night night before. There were any number of things. Uh, Dick Cheney, uh, our, 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 our president, had bone spurs. Any <laughs> clever guy yeah. in my era could get out of the draft. So I was either not clever or I chose not to do that. And I still am not sure. My, my heroic sense of self tells me that I didn't want to go there. I just didn't want to default on what I knew to be true and ethical in my, myself. That's giving me far too much credit. <laughs> but that's what I think I thought then. Oh, good for you. You had integrity. But you were stationed. Uh, well, whatever I called it at the <laughs> yeah. But you were stationed in the Long Island <coughs> City, so yeah. But, yeah. but I did uh, uh, the. Uh, but I didn't know I was going to be stationed there. Yeah, I, I went and did basic training in Fort Dix in December. Oh, I still don't like camping <laughs> because you you go out with half a pup tent uh, in the middle of December in New Jersey where it's wet and cold. Uh, that's not fun. And uh, I, I didn't know. The guys around me, when we were standing in line after basic training, where are you, where are you going? One guy's going to tank school. The other guy's going to get his ear blown off in submarine school. I don't know. And Peter Bonner's, you're going to Long Island City. The guy standing next to me, he said, I said, what's there? And he said, it's the, it's the movie place, you fuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Marx Brothers made uh, animal crackers and uh, and coconuts oh, there. Oh yeah, yeah, it's uh, historic. Uh, uh, King King Kong King, stuff. We sure, there. absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And I directed so, some wonderful stuff there. I, I directed a show. Uh, I don't remember, but I, I I went back as a director. Did you leave the army and rejoin the premise? Or I'm trying. I'm trying to. Uh, I'm trying to figure out how you got to the committee. Uh, I left the army, and this guy who was directing me at the premise had a friend named Alan Meyerson who was starting a theater company in San Francisco, and I went and got plugged into that theater company called The Committee, right? Which is an historic of improvisational and, and uh, the old bocce company. court. Exactly. Yeah. It was it, actually next to the old. Bocce oh, it was next to the. I've, I've obviously yes. was long gone. And what do you remember <laughs> by the time I was of age? <laughs> what do you remember about working with Woody Allen back then? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing at all. Cuz I didn't work with him, I worked yeah. against him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Woody went off and I came on. I, yeah. I, I followed a really funny guy, a genius. Yeah. Did he really have new material every time you saw him? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> that that's how it appeared to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so who was in the committee? It was Howard Hesseman, who we love. Yeah, you know, you got it written down there. You, I, I know, can see your but, eyes. But you we're going to go through it there. for our listeners. Yeah. Roger Bowen, who we loved. Oh, Roger remember Roger Blake. Bowen from he was Colonel, uh, Henry Blake in, in the Mash movie. Oh, okay. And uh, and Carl Gottlieb, who was here on the show. Great people. Yes. 
What, was there any... Larry, sa- Larry Hankin. Oh, Larry Hankin, who's still around. Funny oh, guy. yes. Yes, yes. Was there any uh, written material, Peter, with the committee, or was it all improvised? Well, um, what is writing? <laughs> okay. <laughs> is it, you know, uh, we would, what we would do is we would uh, uh, do sketches that were developed from improvisational uh, 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 undertakings. So we would go out and ask ask an audience, give us an idea of a social occasion. Someone would say, blind date. And then a man or woman would, would, would go on stage and they'd improvise a scene about a blind date. Uh, and if it worked that time, we would then take it into workshop. I see. And we'd work it up in, into a scene and look for an ending because it, <laughs> the sad thing about improvising on the stage is unless you're brilliant, uh, unless you're really Severin Darden or Mike Nichols or, or Elaine May, you don't come up with endings bang like that usually. Sometimes you do and uh, you impress yourself. But usually you workshop these these things, you cut them down. And that's what, what occasioned my uh, uh, initial work as a director is I would help to to uh, um, form these these improvisational th- undertakings into scenes. So you could say that I was writing mm-hmm. of a sort. <laughs> what, what, what I would have given to see the committee in those days to see all those yeah. people up there and Mel Stewart, well, who we loved. <clears throat> Oh yeah, Gary. Gary Goodrow. Uh, Gary Goodrow. Oh, oh, oh! Just was Rob, Rob Reiner in there at some point? Yeah, 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 yeah. He was in the workshops and he would guest star. He never was. I, I don't think he was ever paid as a performer. I see. Um, but the thing to remember about the committee in those days, this was the uh, the sixties uh, and early seventies. So it was Vietnam and uh, the psychedelic revolution. So we had it all in San Francisco. Uh, we could be uh, impactful politically every night. Wow. We would go out and do uh, agitprop theater. We we were working really hard as artists to stop that foolish war. We would go off in the afternoons to uh, uh, Berkeley and attend demonstrations and entertain the people on the steps of Sproul Hall. At night, uh, Joan Baez and and, uh, and Bob Dylan would come in to see the show. How about that? Wow. Uh, you know, we'd go and see the music, and they, they'd come to see our, our show. Uh, San Francisco at that time was a, a, a swell place to be. That's sort of how you got discovered for, for legitimate television, for le- legitimate actually, acting roles, right? They sent actually, Fred Roos to uh, see you and some casting yeah. people? But before that, a, a wonderful director uh, named John Cordy had seen the show at, at the committee, and uh, we went out to lunch, and he said, I, I'm thinking maybe <clears throat> doing a film about a performer in improvisational theater. Uh, so we got, got together, and we concocted a film which turned out to be Funny Man. Funny Man. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, we raised money. In those days, you could raise two hundred fifty thousand dollars in San Francisco, and and made made the film and took it to New York New York Film Festival, and it did reasonably well. Uh, and uh, a William Morris agencies chap saw the film and signed me up. And uh, I see that was good because William Morris in those days was one of the premier agencies. Uh, so that was important. And then my friend Sandy Barron got a job in a television show called Hey Landlord. Hey Landlord, yeah. And he invited me down to see the show, and I met Gary Marshall, I met some other people, and uh, Jerry Paris, and they had me down to do a, a guest star, and that sort of got me uh, seen in Los Angeles. I see. You know, And the rest, the rest is history. <laughs> get, getting back to that thing with endings, I yes. think that's where... Monty Python developed that giant boot that oh, sure. crushes. All, all the animations would just yeah. stop. The, or they would, oh, have, yeah. they would have another actor walk in and just right. stop the sketch. Yeah. This is silly. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or, or just say now for something completely sure, different. Sure, to avoid writing we, it in. We had the same same thing at the, uh, at, at the, at the committee. 
and Ted Flicker did, <laughs> although it was harder for Ted because they only had four actors. And some say, sometimes they were all on stage at the same time. It was hard to turn the lights off on stage. So one of the actors, Ted usually, would reach off when the scene just was going on and on. He'd wait for what, what, <clears throat> what could be described as laughter, and he'd reach off t- to the side and pull the light switch. <laughs> so <laughs> the, the uh, boot, blackout. Or, or the yeah exactly yeah we just turned the lights off <laughs> <laughs> whatever works exactly. Gilbert did you ever do improv did you ever were you were, would you be good at something like that fast uh, on your feet so, uh, yeah I would do improv um, but I, I it was funny you know when you ask comics to do improv comics go for the joke yeah. And it's like, you know, you don't want to play by, like, you know, they go where they go, oh, there are certain rules. Well, well, well yeah. there, there are rules, and you just hit upon one of Paul Sill's rules. Don't do jokes. Because what a joke does is it stops the dramatic flow of a human interchange. Right? Yes. You tell a joke here. And it stops our conversation. Interesting. Because we laugh and then we say, oh, now what happens? Oh. And a dramatic scene or a comedic scene, something always has to happen next. Uh, Famously, Mike Nichols repeatedly told Doc Simon, don't go for the joke. Go for the human interaction. That's what the audience is going to remember. They're not going to remember your jokes. They're gonna rem- they're gonna remember Felix and uh, what's his name Oscar, Oscar. Yeah. That's what they're gonna remember that relationship, not your jokes. So the comic always goes for the jokes. So when we were casting a show in improvisational theater, we didn't look for the we didn't look for comedians. We looked for actors who were funny. There's a yeah. difference. Yeah, that's interesting. Peter Cook was one one of the funniest actors I've ever worked with. And if you look at a Peter Cook monologue, it's not jokes. It's I could have been a judge if I only had the Latin. Mm -hmm. That's not a joke. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That describes an entire sad person thinking he could have been something if he had just spoken Latin. (laughs) <laughs> well, si- since you brought up Peter Cook, can I jump ahead to you directing uh, the two of us yeah. and and, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and working with one of your comedy heroes? Oh, man. Because I know you were a fan of Beyond the Fringe. and uh... No, there have been certain jobs that I've had where I would go to work with such anticipation and come home younger and more awake than when I left. Wow. And that was true with Peter Cook. And I must say it was true with, Peter, uh, with Tim Allen. Mm-hmm. Working, uh, I don't know how he is today because I've watched Last Man Standing, and, and, and he's gotten sort of um, stricter. He, he's he's he, he doesn't seem as free with himself. I, I don't know. That's because we probably differ politically. Maybe I'm reading that in. But uh-huh. going to work with Tim Allen or Peter Cook, the, it was such a joy on the set because they would constantly amused themselves and everybody within earshot using everything they had props the dialogue as written the dialogue as not written uh the cameraman falling asleep whatever it was a joy to work with that's a nice thing to say about those people Oh, my gosh. Could we ask you about some of these early TV roles? Because you brought up uh, uh, Gary Marshall and Jerry Belson's Hey, Landlord. Sure. We love oh, talking boy. about Sandy Barron, by the way. Any excuse to talk about Sandy <laughs> Barron? You did Sanford and Son. You did The Addams Family. Yeah. You did a bunch the of Adams stuff. The Family. The only reason I did, did The Addams Family is uh, I was living in New York, and they wanted me to come out to do a, uh, a pilot. No, they didn't want me to do the pilot. They wanted me to do a, uh, a test for a pilot. It was sort of a ripoff of uh, Get Smart. And uh, so I went out, to, and they flew me all the way out from New York City, put me up in a hotel. So this, the, the, 
this was expensive, cost maybe a thousand dollars. So to pay for it, they cast me in the Adams family. I see. And that show, the only part available was, uh, I don't know, a CPA or something. But I had to look older, so they actually grayed my hair. So if you see that me in that, <laughs> it's a 28-year-old guy with shoe polish in his so hair. You're a young actor. I heard you say John Aston was good to you. Oh, he was very nice. Yeah. He he uh, stayed on after, after work and uh, acted with me in my screen test. Well, he loves actors. He's still teaching acting in uh, in Baltimore. Oh, really? Yeah, uh, he's, he he's just, teaching in the drama school. It was great. Bears his name. Yeah. Any memories of Red Fox on Sanford and Son? Oh, I came to work with a gun. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, this. Uh, most people weren't caring. Uh, I assume you two guys are sitting there in New York and you're armed because <laughs> yeah, we're, days we're in New York. <laughs> everybody in the world is armed. Uh, but in those days, not everybody was armed. You know, the National Rifles Association wasn't bigger than the post office in those days. Uh, but he came to work one day and at, at the reading, uh, <laughs> I don't know, he, he said, I'm, I'm here for the reading. And then I'm going to the track, okay? And the writers looked at each other, and the producer looked at me. I was directing, and I was supposed to say, well, no, we're going to rehearse. And before anybody could say anything, he reached into his pocket and pulled out this enormous Smith & Weston and went, <laughs> put, put this gun on the table. So there was no argument with Red in those, those days. I... Uh, but I'll tell you, that being said, he was funny. Oh, yeah. Boy, oh, boy, was he funny. And people who write for funny people do get it. They Like you guys have researched a guy named Peter Bonners. I can tell by the questions you're asking and the knowledge you have of my, my uh, life. Uh, they sit down and they look at the material, they listen to the material, they, they, they think about it, they talk about it. So by the time they write for the, for the star, the Gilbert Gottfried, they know that guy. They know the rhythm. The people who wrote for Newhart, boy, they had him down. Newhart would be astonished sometimes mm -hmm. at how they got his voice and his voicings. That's fascinating. And, and that was true of Red. And, and, and this wasn't a, a room full of, of older black fellows. No, it was, was Orrin Steen and Turtletaub. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> What's that story? He said, a, get me a my Jew Jew from Jew Toronto. <laughs> What's he, get me my Jews? Oh, that yeah. That Red Fox story. Uh, <laughs> Red Fox at one yeah. point got angry, got and he was very militant at one point. <laughs> yeah. And he said, no, I, I want just black people working for me. <laughs> And they got all black people, and the shows weren't working out. The, the scripts, the the material was terrible. The scripts weren't there on time. Everything yeah, yeah, was yeah. off. And then finally, Red Fox throws his hands up in the air and goes, "Get me my juice back." <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, that's hilarious. I'm going to... Well, go, go ahead, Gil. Oh, I I heard a story, and another name that pops up on this show a lot, <laughs> that Danny Thomas used to carry a gun. Oh, really? Interesting. Well, I never worked with Danny Thomas, so I have no, no knowledge. Well, you know, you know, Bill Persky, who you did work with. Yeah, uh, oh, sure. On, Billy, uh, on that girl. Bill, Bill directed Damon Wilson. In a show oh, called yes. Baby on Back, and he told uh -huh. us that, that he carried a gun too. <laughs> yeah. So there's the sa both Sanford and Son. <laughs> I don't know what it was. Maybe it's, I don't know either. Per Persky and, uh, and Denoff. Denoff. And yeah. Persky and Denoff. Demond didn't get along. Oh, no, too. they didn't get oh, along. Oh, oh. Because well, I remember well, I said to Persky that now I heard Demond Wilson's a preacher, and Persky said, there's no God. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. 
<laughs> I got to read this real quick, Peter. This is because this is just fun for us. This this is we alluded to it in the in the beginning of the show. This is a very short list of the people that have been here on this show that you've worked with in your career. And I do a lot of research. I don't think we've ever had anybody here who's worked. <laughs> this breaks the record. I'm going to go through it quick. Oh. We, we mentioned Jessica Walter, Chuck McCann, Mike McKean, Lee Merriweather, Hal Linden. Uh, we just mentioned Bill Persky, who you work with on that girl. Ken Berry, Bernie Coppell, Paul Dooley, Stuart Margolin, Stephen Weber, D. Wallace, Alan Thick, ah. Andrea Martin, Joyce Van Patten, John Amos, Tony Roberts, the late great Jay Thomas, David Steinberg, and Norman Steinberg, Penn Jillette, Billy Persky again, Ed Asner, Bill Macy, Norman Lear, Carl Reiner, Carl Gottlieb, Buck Henry, Richard Benjamin, Richard Kind, Adam West, future guest Alan Alda, we'll throw in Dick Cavett, <laughs> and and you played Ed Weinberger, who we had on this show. Yes. yes. Ah! You, but you didn't mention Captain Kangaroo. Oh, <laughs> you, no, we didn't well, have. well, he was. I tell you, he was a fabulous Bob human Keishan. being. Uh, yeah. Captain Kangaroo. You didn't mention Robert Kennedy, uh, uh, oh. uh, or, or rather John Kennedy Jr. Oh, well, those are the people who weren't here. These were all people well, we had on the yeah. show. Yeah, all, all, all these, these were people we've had on these the show. These were all our guests. Amazing. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, twenty-eight. Yeah, you break the record. You broke it. Well, that's not true. counting Gilbert Gottfried. <laughs> <laughs> Most people don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's what's so amazing. And I kept finding our uh, our guests and doing the research. We've never had him on the show, but I had to get to this. Uh, did you once direct O.J. Simpson? Oh, not and- only direct him, I worked with with him as he he was the uh, one of the executive producers on a show. It, it was a rather low point in my career. Uh, I had wished to be a uh, motion picture director, so I went out and directed a couple of uh, pictures. The mistake that I made was uh, somebody came at, at me with a script, and they said, do you want to direct this picture? And what I heard was, do you want to direct this picture? The question I should have heard was, do you want to direct this picture. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I picked the wrong script or two. <clears throat> and they sent me to movie jail. I see. When you go out and you're, you're a newcomer film director and you fail in your first two films, the phone doesn't ring. It just sort of sits there menacing. So I was really not desperate, but I was looking for work. And O.J. Simpson had this show called First and Ten. They were looking for it for a director. And it meant uh, directing, I don't know, 20-some shows in 15 days using football players and pads in the heat of summertime. So I did direct O.J. Uh, And he was a very uh, incredibly charming fellow. An incredibly powerful personality. Uh... You used the the word earlier, sociopath. I did. <laughs> that our, that would president. describe that would describe OJ. Yeah, well, clearly. Um, and but I do remember his uh, uh, relationship to the Los Angeles Police Department. We'd be on location a lot, <clears throat> and every day we'd have lunch out- outdoors at big uh, picnic tables, and hundreds of police would show up for autographs. And they'd bring footballs, they'd bring helmets, wow. they'd bring jer- uh, jerseys. And he loved the police. And they loved him. So when this thing happened with his wife, uh, I, I wasn't at all surprised at the uh, care they, they treated him with because he was one of their own. They, they really liked O.J., and I, I think they took a while b- before they m- made the obvious decision to, well, wait a second. When a wife is killed like that violently, who's the first person you suspect? Always. Always. It's the husband. Always. In OJ, it took him like 10 days to even say, well, wait a minute. Who's, who's she married to again? <laughs> and it's funny. They were very slow. Interesting. How they played up like the racist police department, 
But meanwhile, well, they was... were his fans and his friends. Oh, they were. But that, but but they they Johnny Cochran was a fabulous lawyer. And the people who I think the guy who uncovered uh, what was the police detective's name? Furman. Furman. Mark, Mark Furman. Uh, Mark Furman. The people who uncovered that the person who uncovered that name was Jeff Tubin. Of the New York Times. Oh yes, he's the guy who did the research. Yes, uh, that that uncovered that name, and that then that name got to Johnny Cochran and his lawyers. Can we? History s- is history is very strange. You it, don't want to talk it about is. this. It you is. want to talk about show business? I, <laughs> show business. I hope you never said to OJ's giving a bad performance or anything. <laughs> Act better. No, uh, the fact fact is he didn't give bad performances. But he didn't give good performances either. Uh-huh. He, he just behaved like OJ, uh-huh. yeah. like like the sports guy that, that he was. He knew enough to behave like himself. He, he had the right smile. And, oh, yeah. Well, he yeah. was a sports yeah. announcer. He was a color guy. Yeah. yeah. He was. Uh, by the time he he uh, did the show, he had done any number of television commercials. He yeah. was the Avis guy, or sure. Now he's in the Towering also. Inferno by that point. Too. Yeah, yeah, some, yeah. That's no, he had a whole, 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 whole career. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the one, one job that you failed to mention. Yes. <laughs> uh, which was one of my last jobs was directing a circus show. Okay. Up in, up, up in uh, Seattle, and again in San Francisco, called the Teatro Zinzani, and it's a a uh, uh, in the round. A variety circus show, so I got to work with all these international circus stars. That's fun. Jugglers and unicyclists and magicians and stuff. Oh, that was great. Yeah, and it reminded me it's all show business. It all is. Whether it's a multi-hundred dollar, hundred million dollar movie or a, 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 a little comedy club at an airport. I it's saw, all show business. You're, you love show business. I saw that in the interview. I, well, it's it's the thing that I liked, yes. whether it was a circus or a big movie or a little television show. I, I really do like show business because you're uh, you're giving people something back. Oh yeah, you're taking their their lives and saying, well, this is what's funny about your life. This is what's good about your life. This is how you can act better. <laughs> <laughs> it comes back to that, Gilbert. Yeah. <laughs> And now, after All in the Family ended, there was a a strange show uh, that I always found it very awkward to watch called Archie Bunker's Place that you directed. Right. Now, what was wrong with that show? (laughs) (laughs) I love the way you ask questions. (laughs) Yeah. It wasn't Peter's fault. No, not not your fault. No, there wasn't anything right about it, a, a, except for Carol Carol O'Connor and uh, Marty Balsam. Martin Balsam, yeah, yeah, uh, and, and and they had some really good writers, but it wasn't about anything. It, it was about him sitting at a bar and just being Archie Bunker. That that wasn't what All in the Family was. No, All, all, all in the Family was Meathead and his black neighbor and his wife. And Maud, it, it was about America at that time. Archie Bunker's place was about a bar at the corner. It wasn't even as good as, uh, 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 well, I, I, I don't want to go there. But it just wasn't about anything. Yeah, it, it was about let's try to keep this franchise, uh, uh, this franchise alive for another fifteen minutes. Did you but, enjoy working with Carol O'Connor? Sure. Yeah. Well, that goes back to our previous discussion. I enjoyed it because it was show business. Uh huh. Because I and remember. I, uh, huh? No, I remember the show. Yeah. Every episode of it just kind of sat really? there. Well, he sat there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in Archie's bunk, in Archie Bunker's place, he sat there too, but they all ran around him. Right. Right. Well, she was, was no running co- around him. She was making uh, chicken casserole. Meathead was c- coming in. The well, neighbor they, was coming in. They gave in. him the Maud. little girl on on Archie Bunker's place. That they tried to make the uh, 
What was her oh. name? Danielle Brebois. They tried they to make her tried. the conflict. Exactly. It just, it, it didn't. Exactly. It, well, it just, well, you try to add these these things. It's like you you make a. I know. You make some soup at home, and, and you should just let it go if it's not working. Don't keep keep adding and. We talked to That's, Norman about it. He doesn't have anything nice to say about it either. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what was Martin Balsam like? He he was well. By the time I met him uh, on Catch Twenty Two, where I actually did 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 meet him and uh then again on uh, archie bunk bunker's place he was a grand old man and he had wonderful stories about theater about um uh working with sydney lumet and 12 12 mm, sure. ang- angry man sure and uh you know it, it wasn't so much working with him it was being with him that's great because he was a he, he was a grand veteran of the show business of the show business. Yeah. I love that. Uh, Joyce Van Patten's ex-husband, by the way, Martin Balsam. Oh. Yes. Father of father and mother of Talia Balsam. This just in. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> who, was mar- who was married to George Clooney. Since, since we're bringing up Norman Lear, George too. George Clooney. George yeah. Clooney. I directed in a show called... ER. Oh, the first ER. Not, not yes. the one hour version, but oh. the wonderful Norman Lear yeah. half hour show. Oh, oh that was Elliot Gould. That good. Huh? Yeah, the one with Elliot Gould. With Elliot Gould, yeah. 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 yeah oh, remember. that and was Conchata a fabulous Farrell. show. Uh huh. Yeah. I was going to say, speaking of Norman Lear, a- a- Apple Pie was a show that I liked with uh, uh, Rue McClanahan and Jack Guilford. Yeah. You directed that too. I did. I directed yeah. the pilot. Yeah, and uh, that that like the ER show was from a play in Chicago. Uh, you know what what Norman did in those those days is he he would get ideas from else elsewhere. You know, all all, all in the family was a London show. Right. Uh, um, ER was a Chicago play. Um, the, the the show Apple Pie was from an I think an off Broadway play about the depression. It, it was a f- really a terrific show. Got a great cast a, a, and a, a great great cast. Wonderful scripts. Charlie Hawk, who is mm-hmm. magnificent writer, um, really wrote sensational stuff. We had Richard Liberatini on the show. Oh, I love we him. had great actors on uh, on the show. Um, the yeah, but it was a, a period piece, half hour comedy, mm-hmm. and I think that kept it from working as well as it should have worked with the American public. There was nothing wrong with the show; the show was great, but I don't think it was ever accepted. I don't think people want to sit home and look at period pieces. Now, now that being being said, they they did like that '50s show in Chicago with. Um, um, what was the name of that show set in Mill? Mil- oh, uh, Happy was, Days. Happy Days. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That was a period piece, but it was it, it wasn't the Depression period, right? Yeah. Well, Gary David Goldberg did uh, also had trouble with uh, finding an audience for that uh, Brooklyn Bridge, another period show, good period uh, show. I don't even remember that. With Marion oh, Ross. What was the show that uh, Rob Reiner? Rob, was that the the show that Gelbart? Uh, I think he was he played an immigrant. Yes, uh, it was short lived. Nor- uh, Bud, well, Bud, see- Bud York and a Norman Lear might have been behind that show. I'll, yeah, I'll think of the name of it in a minute. Uh, I think many have tried, but few have succeeded. Yeah, to do period period half hours. I think the audience for a half hour I speak like I know something but I've directed a lot of them and acted in a fair share I think audiences really want to see themselves up there with a laugh track yeah that's interesting and I'm not kidding about the laugh track I just saw again the other day a piece <clears throat> about two two people putting together a situation com- comedy and the ar- argument was about the laugh track and I've always made the 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 uh, the argument for the laugh track that you're sitting at home watching television and something funny happens or f- something funny is said. And if you've got that laugh track, you become a member of a larger audience. You're not just sitting there alone in your home or with your your small family. You're You're given permission to laugh at it. That's interesting. Because you're in an audience. That's what makes live theater so wonderful. I, I, you, you rem- c- 
I remember they did an episode of The Art Couple without a laugh track. First season. Yeah. Uh-huh. And it, it was kind of awkward to watch. Yeah. 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 Well, and then, you no, know. We've all, we've all tried it. Uh, for a whole season of Murphy Brown, for example, while Candace, her husband, Louie, was uh, uh, terminal, uh, she could only work two, three days a week. And we didn't have show. Uh, we didn't have time to really get the show mounted correctly f- for an audience, and oh. that was a big show anyway. Yeah. So we 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 do it without an audience. But what we did <clears throat> is we hired um, we, we hired uh, actors to be in the audience. N- not and, and they were advised don't laugh just because you think it's supposed to be funny. Only laugh if y- you want to laugh. And they were a very good audience. That's interesting. Yeah. How many people the would problem, you put out there? Uh, let's see. Uh, probably about 50. Interesting. And then you'd multiply the laughs. That's different. The problem, as I saw with later sitcoms, as I did, the last sitcom I directed was three, four years ago, the audiences come in so hot, they've been warmed up to such a degree <clears throat> that they over the shows. They literally laugh at anything. A kid walks on with suspenders. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're just, they want to perform as an audience. That's why they're there. That's why they get free pizzas or laugh, a t-shirt. Laugh tracks almost seem quaint now, like it's really becoming a thing of the past. If you look at, tele- I, uh, if you look at comedy on television. Uh, well, uh, I don't. Yeah. I don't look at television comedy. I watch television. <clears throat> uh, you know, I, I watch Better Call Saul. I, I watch The Deuce. Uh, I watch uh, right. shows that I really Film that shows. I really like. Uh, yeah. I th- I think The Wire is still the best television ever made. Uh, and, and I'll watch some shows that have humor in them, but but I I don't know the last half hour comedy that I watched. Maybe it's a function of my getting old. I don't know, but I do what I want to do now. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't do. Uh, I don't look at stuff just because. Like it's your job to look at stuff, because you have a show on the air which necessitates your 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 being up to date. I don't have to be up to date with anything. I can I can read two new newspapers a day or not. It's a nice luxury. Well, it is, but uh, I, I'm I'm a very lucky guy. Let's let's talk uh, about a show that uh, that didn't have to rely on a laugh track. That's the the, the great Bob Newhart show, and and we we want to ask you about this. The timing of this is is uh, is unfortunate, but uh, your friend Bill Daly just passed away. Yep, and we we thought we'd ask you uh, a memory or two. Um, <clears throat> Gilbert and I are such admirers. Yeah, he was as Bob said, he was the bullpen guy. When a scene was flagging, uh, if they could, they'd figure out a way to, to bring Bill's character on. It's like a bullpen pitcher. You just go to his character, and you can get a laugh. And you don't have to strain for it. You know, he's late. He forgot to wind his watch. He's, he could just make stuff work quickly. Uh, and Bob trusted him. They were old Chicago friends. And, you know, he wasn't the most reliable fellow. He could get nervous. He could forget his lines and stuff. And other people could get frustrated with takes one, two, three, four, five, because he would forget a line or a name or something. Bob never did. Never, uh, how nice. Never, never got frustrated with him. There, there was a great uh, uh, love there. Um. And he was, he was one of those guys that I wouldn't say act better because he was always as good as he was going to be. I see. <laughs> no, he really came yeah. as prepared as he could. And if, if he gave him too much direction or uh, tried something too much, it, it would unnerve him a little bit. He was a natural funny guy. And a very charming guy, and, and a real ladies' man. Oh, he he could charm the pants off anybody. Uh, 
And, and as his sons said repeatedly in 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 the obits, he. Uh, Oh, that's my telephone. That's okay. It's usually Gilbert's going off, yeah. Peter. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just uh, shut it off here. Um, he, his son said he was the happiest guy he knew. I saw that. It was sweet. Yeah, and he looked for ways to be happy. That's what he said. He looked for ways to be happy every yeah. day. And, I- and, and, and when something unhappy presented itself, he'd just sort of turn aside. That's a nice quality. It's, it's, it's a remarkable quality, really, yeah. And I heard Bob Newhart used to write his dialogue around the set. <laughs> He'd have it on, like, furniture. And... Very, very rarely. No, it is a funny thing. <laughs> That's a brand yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> No, it's a visual thing uh, uh, that, that he tells uh, of himself. But every once in a while, he, they would write these long phone calls. Uh, because Bob was known as a monologist who who, who talked on the phone, and uh, there were sometimes three pages long, and he would often, if he was home, write them. In his office, it was easy because he 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 would have a desk and some yellow pads there, but at home he just had the couch, <clears throat> so we'd put them on cards and pasted them to the back of the couch, so he could be on the phone standing. Uh, on set facing this big long wall of text and he was very good i mean actors get good at reading cue cards <laughs> we had they had taped up this stuff with masking tape or something and in the middle of his conversation the tape started to unpeel <laughs> from a corner so if you can visualize this the corner came came down and slowly started to disappear from his view as, as the tape. <laughs> he he started to bend over <laughs> to to read it. And I'm watching him say, "What the hell is he doing?" And finally, just gave up and laughed. <laughs> and he said, "Cut, cut, cut!" And then he ripped the the cue cards off and showed the audience. <laughs> and he said, "This is what happened." You yeah. guys met on on uh, on, on set of Catch Twenty Two. Catch Twenty Two, yeah, yeah. And I threw myself at his feet <clears throat> because, as a as a kid in Milwaukee, you know, I would I probably did some of his material in uh-huh. uh, in the nightclubs in Milwaukee when I was a drummer. Uh, and I remember I was selling records at a at a record store in Milwaukee when his record hit. It was so popular that we just didn't get the box of records in on Monday and put it on the shelf. We just took the box of records and put it on the counter, and people would come in and buy copies. The button-down mind. That, yeah, that's yeah. how popular that record was. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> for, for, for spoken word records in, in, in those days, it was phenomenal. Uh, later on, you know, Shelley re- sold a lot of records, and Lenny Bruce sold a lot of records, and Elaine May and Mike 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 Eccles. But Bob was really there with the button down mind first. I found it he, interesting too, uh, doing the research. I never knew this, and I know the show so well that the, that uh, it changed. You were not originally a dentist, right? I was a psychiatrist. We were both shrinks. And what was right. the what was the premise right. that Lorenzo Music <clears throat> and Dave Davis came up with? He was a Freudian, and you were going to be a Jungian, or yeah, exactly so. Yeah. Yeah, he, he was a, uh, a uh, an established guy, and I was sort of an off the wall. Let's try anything. I see. It turns out that, that that's probably the better way to be a psychiatrist these days, because <laughs> the Freudians that I know have sort of given up on on that, and they become behaviorals and cognitive folks now. Uh, uh, the reason in those days was it tested badly. Oh, did it? Yeah, they accepted Bob. Because he was Bob Newhart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and they had a little trouble with, with the behavioralist, me. Uh, and I, they liked me. Bob liked me, so they tried to figure out a way to keep me on the show. <clears throat> but change changed the character. So between the pilot and the uh, show, a, a couple things changed. Uh, I think in the original show, Suzanne was going to have a baby. Yes, I'd read that. And uh, Bob, uh, that didn't test, or, or, or maybe it was Bob. Uh, you know, babies and, and sitcoms aren't necessarily a good idea either. It's throwing that thing into the pot. 
uh, Murphy Brown's a good example. Uh, you have a phenomenally successful Murphy Brown, who is acerbic and 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 uh, uh, really a ball buster and uh, very negative all the time and then he give her a baby so now she has to be maternal yeah now change the character i i I can't say it didn't work because it did work especially especially the pregnancy episodes but the more she had to care for that child the less seconds she would have to be a ball buster anyway bob didn't want the baby and i think that turned out beautifully for for the show because he, he he and Emily could continue to be the Bickersons I think babies on shows is usually a sign of desperation <laughs> well put that's interesting yeah yeah now tell us about Suzanne Plachette loved her uh, trained actress Talk about show business. She, her father, was the uh, <clears throat> I think he was the manager or the production chief of the Paramount Theater in New York. They lived on Park Avenue. They had some money. <clears throat> uh, her mother didn't cook. They ate in restaurants every night. She was a show business baby. Her father would take her to the theater. Oh, this is uh, Benny Goodman. Oh, Frank Frank Sinatra. She met Frank Sinatra when, when she was probably nine. So she grew up in show business royalty. She went to Syracuse. She was phenomenally pretty. She went to Syracuse University and then uh, came to New York and studied uh, acting. So she was all set. And then she acted and acted and acted, and then she became a movie star. Uh, She was really smart, really talented. She could write. She could write poetry. Uh, she was a very smart businesswoman. Uh, she was married to Tommy Gallagher, who took care of her. If, if you're show business royalty, if you're a big star like Suzanne Plachette, it's good to have a man who understands it. And he took care of her. He would, he would shield her from, from, from uh, those untoward things that happen to, to females in show business. He took care of her business affairs. He was a smooth operator, smoked English oval cigarettes, and lit them, <laughs> lit them with one of those Dunhill lighters that Leslie Howard uses in the movies. You know, he was really a smooth guy. They were so well well matched, really. I mean, whoever thought to 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 put her with Bob Newhart? I think it was. I I think I, I don't know who who it was. Everybody claims credit for it, but I I I would think it might might have been Mary's husband. Uh, what what was his name? The head of oh, MPM Grant, Studios. Grant Tinker. Grant. I think it was Grant. Interesting. Or maybe Bob's manager. Uh, somebody saw her on the Tonight Show. Interesting. She was just a talking head guest, and said, "Boy, oh boy, she's a young, beautiful, uh, tart-tongued Jewess with laconic Midwest." Bob Newhart. Whoa, wow. That's... Yeah, they, they were perfect. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. They were, as you say, perfect. Why are you so interested? I thought you didn't believe in IQ tests. Well, Emily, if I can give up three hours of my life to take an IQ test, you can give up three seconds of your life to answer it for me. What was the score? I don't think people should know their IQs. <laughs> well, you know your IQ. Well, that's different. I have to know mine. Well, I have to know mine. What, what, what was it? 129. 129, that's good, isn't it? Oh, that's very good, Bob. That's almost gifted. (laughs) Almost gifted. What's, uh, what's yours? Oh, it's not important. (laughs) No, I know it's not important, but what is it? (laughs) Uh, I'm embarrassed. Well, honey, don't don't be embarrassed. I had four more years of college than you had on your kids. Bobby, it's 151. It's good, too. And Gilbert worked with Jack Riley 
a couple more a couple of times, didn't you? On the Tonight oh. Show. Oh, yeah. I I never actually worked with him directly. Oh, you did. I remember he used <laughs> I to. You, I thought you he, interacted with him. He I I ran into him there. He looked like the guy in the Hell Bop Comet cult, <laughs> the Heaven Skate right, right. cult. <laughs> it, it was so weird. He looked like that guy, exactly like him. So he had a resurgence in his yeah. career. Oh, oh, he was he was always there. Yeah. No, Jack Jack Riley was one of those guys who was always bubbling up. You know, uh, when they <clears throat> when he died. Uh, I I wasn't able to be there, so I wrote a little uh, uh, test testimonial, and and was really j- just a sort of semiotic um, list of all the roles he played, and it it was read by someone, and they said he, he got really good laughs, good sentimental laughs, just recalling the the roles <laughs> like angry man and sport coat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all kinds of those 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 roles. <laughs> do you you still get mail, Peter? Do I have this right uh, from the yeah. fans of the of the of the New Heart Show? Well, you don't know if they're fans, really. They're, oh, I they're, see. They're, they're <laughs> obsessives. They're, they're people living in towns you've never heard of. I see. And I I think I don't know what what my autograph gets these days but i uh, when i was a minor celebrity there for a while I, I would play in these golf tournaments and i was in a a golf cart one day with a caddy and he asked for my autograph and, and i said what's what's your name and he said phil i said phil why is a 13 year old kid like you asking me you don't even know who i am why are you asking me for my autograph and he said $29. Oh, jeez. That's what he could get for my autograph in 1970 <laughs> or whatever. I love that. So, so I, I, yes, I get mail. But uh, oh, I sometimes see. I, I think it's just for the $29 oh, that, that they're, that they're going to sell it for. Put eBay. it on eBay. I, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I would guess that I'm down to thirteen fifty at this point. I just wanted to, there's, there's so much stuff we could ask you about. Thank you. Yes. Well, you can have me back. <laughs> well, I would, I'd love to ask you about directing Walter Cronkite. I will be Cronkite. entirely different the next time. <laughs> <laughs> will, will you uh, interview better next time? <laughs> yes. Bef- I will come with the accent. How is, yeah, how is okay. that? I have a little, Bef- before uh, we run, I will we, come we, as you, Federico Fellini, and you can ask funny. me all about La Strada. <laughs> Yeah. What, what about, uh, let's see, do you want to talk about hanging out with Orson Welles on the set of Catch-22 or directing? You don't hang out with Orson Welles. <laughs> <laughs> but we heard Richard Benjamin's version of the events. And, oh, yes? Uh, and ben Buck Henry. Everybody, yeah. And I think Bogdanovich yeah. was there at certain points. Yeah, we, we were all there. All yeah. the important people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to tell us about directing Walter Cronkite? <laughs> was that a bizarre experience? No, no. Oh, uh, what was his name? Bob Kendrick. Bob K. Well, uh, Bob Kelson. Oh, he 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 didn't come dressed as Captain King Kangaroo. Oh, Bob uh, Keishan. He, he he was the nicest man. Bob what? Bob Keishan. Bob Keishan. Right. I'll tell you this. Of all the stars we've had on the show uh, that I directed, his appearance on that rehearsal day got more applause than anybody else. Captain Kangaroo. Bob Keishan. I love that. That's great. Well, because people had grown up with this wonderful chap. I, God knows what the people would have done if we had had Mr. Rogers on. Right? They, they <laughs> yeah. They would have lauded him. But uh, He was a giant. He was... Uh, I, I also directed Walter Cronkite. Yeah, I have that on my cards. And at a certain point, I I wanted Walter Cronkite <laughs> to look at the camera, and uh, he turned around to me and said, "You know, I've done this before." <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> oh, there's so many things we could ask you about, Peter. We barely well, we, don't. we barely got into it. But we'll, uh, next time we'll, we sit with you, we'll talk about medium cool. Well, the next time uh, y- you can ask ask me about other things or other people besides myself. 
Yeah. I'll, 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 I'll just make a lot of the shit up anyway, well, as I've been doing all day today. You, you work with, you, well, I'll ask you quickly, you work with one of Gilbert's favorites, and that's Jack Guilford. Yes. Oh, oh my goodness, yes. Jack Guilford was, uh, you know, he would have possibly been as big as Zero Mistel. But he's, he's, he's one of those people whose career was absolutely subtended oh, yeah. by the blacklist. Absolutely. He was a known communist sympathizer, and he had a big career going, and he couldn't get a job. Great talent. First, yeah, yeah. And I work, worked with him. He was, he, he was one of those guys uh, who – uh, delivered, you know. You'd come come to work, and they, by the time I worked with him, he was playing the geezer, and uh, he, he could play it better than anybody. There are sad things in show business, and and the blacklist is is another one of those sad things. Absolutely, Absolutely. Uh, that that we do to ourselves. It's like guns. The country has a, a way of doing itself in every once in a while. We're living through it. Absolutely. Unfortunately, I got one more well, for Frank, you. Yeah, go ahead, P- Peter what, Ustinov. What time is it, Peter? <laughs> any any mem- any memories of working with him? Uh, well, uh, I uh, he 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 drew, drew he he was a very good artist, and he drew uh, on the back of a napkin. He drew a picture of Brezhnev when uh, 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 there was. The Cold War was bubbling up, and and uh, he, he he drew this caricature of, of Brezhnev, and on the bottom there was a quote saying, uh, "We're we won't invade Poland or something." Like that. <laughs> he was a real uh, wet, wasn't he? Yes, yes, he was, and uh, again by the by the time we worked together, I I was an actor on on the show. I played his his nephew or written, grandson. written by Rod Serling. Yes. Yeah. Rod, here, I'll tell you a Rod Serling story rather than a Peter Yusinoff story. Okay. Uh, it was the table reading, and uh, we all came in to this uh, uh, CBS studio, and we all had green leather binders with our names in gold on them. So it was a very special event. We all sat down and opened our green leather binders to page one, and we read and we read and we read. Peter didn't open his, or I mean Rod didn't open his binder and we got to the middle of the thing and uh, Peter miss um, replaced a word and Rod Serling said I believe that's uh, and and corrected him without ever opening the book without ever open <laughs> that's opening great. The book. that's it a writer's really, story it was really scary <laughs> That, that, that is great. So, well, we'll probably wrap, Peter. We okay, could go, good. We could we could go on for hours. It's uh, ten after five, but, but, and and this is when the uh, little cuckoo clock in my living room goes cuckoo five times, and my hand automatically reaches for the bottle of Johnny Walker. Oh, I see. so uh, well, it's, it's, it's like I'm, those I'm, it's like those sketches. We have no ending. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Turn the lights off. We okay, thank you. goodbye, we thank, Frank. We, goodbye, we thank Gilbert. You. We nice thank you for doing you this. Again. We're going to oh, do a quick... My, my we'll pleasure. Do a, we'll a do a quick time. sign-off. Hang on. Okay. Okay, this has been uh, Gilbert Gottfried's Amazing Cult. <laughs> yes, <laughs> You forgot the name of the show. Oh, uh, Peter, we forgot the name of the show. <laughs> Act better. <laughs> could, you, could you direct him through the clothes? <laughs> Put your glasses on. Read the words written in front of you. (laughs) With with the great Peter Bonnard. Peter, this was fun for us. Okay. Good uh, good trip down memory lane. Good. Well, it was fun for me, too. It reminds me what a good time I've had in show business. Oh, great. And, and this is just for shits and giggles, but I want to direct people to find a clip online of you helping a woman win 10 grand on the $20,000 pyramid. Oh, yeah. And I must yes. say, you're, the, you're the, probably the best clue giver I've seen <laughs> on, on, on that show. And well, she, she got the last answer with one second to go. Ah, that too is show business.